Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of The Surge. Um, so, you know, uh, I'm sure that all, all of you have heard of the novel coronavirus and the pandemic that uh, we're all experiencing worldwide. Uh, I'm sure that many of you are, are relatively frustrated uh, by multiple things. Uh, first is probably the fact that you can't help out or feel that you can't help out or you haven't been called in to help out. Um, the second is probably... You know, a feeling of remorse, maybe, or survivor's guilt, or or the stress of it, especially if you're a healthcare worker. And thirdly, possibly, the fact that you're, you know, and this is the least of everybody's worries, uh, frustrated by the um, social isolation, self isolation uh, strategy that 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 we are all having to endure, and, and the sheer boredom of it, as opposed to the effectiveness. I think that it's extremely effective. Now. Um, Today, I was hoping to allude to some of the conversations that maybe are happening and will be happening worldwide uh, as we come to grips with our new reality dealing with this pandemic. And that's ward rounds, when you're in full isolation. Now, uh, this talk is not geared towards uh, the situation where you have a dedicated COVID center that only has COVID-19 slash corona slash novel coronavirus uh, patients in it in a similar manner that you, we used to have uh, TB centers that were dedicated just to TB, right? Uh, this is in the situation where you maybe have 50% of your capacity, maybe even less, maybe maybe it could be 5% of your capacity in certain countries, right? Maybe even less than that, dedicated towards uh, COVID-19 positive patients, and th the rest of your hospital isn't. And so now you're in a position where you're going to have to fully isolate these patients and protect them as a priority first, so treat the patients, obviously, but also make sure that nobody else gets infected and the rest of your workforce remains healthy. And, you know, I can't emphasize that enough. I talked about it before with personal protective equipment, but, you know, in France and in Italy, we're talking about up to 20% of the workforce being uh, off of work. And that just weakens your army, weakens your side. So as a disclaimer... You know, I'm not an expert at COVID-19. I'm not an infectious disease specialist, but I do a lot of uh, complex process analyses uh, for uh, systems, healthcare systems, as a hobby, and I provide some consultancy. And so, you know, those skill sets, they align differently to, to uh, evidence-based studies because so complex sciences, they tell you why things are the way they are, and help you come up with strategies to improve them. But they can't really predict where things are going to go. And so I, that's why I'm saying, as a disclaimer, everything that I say is taken in that context. I, I can tell you where the potential variables to be optimized are and why. You might want to think about them, but I can't tell you that by doing these things, you're not going to end up with a different set of problems, right? And it's, it's sort of... It's, it's like the deficiencies of any RCT, pretty much. So when you look at randomized controlled trials, even multi-center ones, the, translab the translatability is always an argument that can be made. It's very rarely made with a very strong um, justification, but it can always potentially be made. And I would look at this the same way. So today we're not going to talk about PPE. I did a whole dedicated talk on personal protective equipment and how to address that and how to train people for it. You know, we're going to be talking about how to set up a dedicated committee based on institutional constraints, obviously, to address, number one, the risk factors for healthcare transmission, number two, performing rounds, assessments, and any other sort of tips and tricks during that time period while limiting the spread to the rest of the hospital and keeping the rest of your patients safe, as well as your COVID-19 patients safe and maintaining a standard of practice despite limited resources. And, you know, you can think of this as a sort of set of meeting minutes or a set of, you know, what you should have on your agenda when you're planning these things, if you're fortunate enough to have the time to plan them. Now, when I approached this topic, I read through like the 300 plus page handbook on COVID-19, which is freely available from um, Zhejiang University, and it's phenomenal. The stuff that they're doing is phenomenal. Um, I've heard some people say that, you know, some of the videos and things like that are sort of like propaganda-ish or maybe the ideal situation, and that's not really how they do it. I can tell you that's how they do it. 
because you know I've been invited to places in Hong Kong and across China to give talks, and they do have that level of capability and efficiency when they need it. Because you really have to understand, they they're used to building um, scalable solutions outside of healthcare sectors, and so translating that to the healthcare sector. Is a very intuitive thing for them because it's ingrained in the culture, right? I'm not saying that they're better than anybody else, but I am saying that everything that's in that book probably did happen. They probably did try it out, and it probably did work for them in the manner that they said, right? And you know that's that's just the way that it works. So I would read it if you're going to be taking care of these patients, particularly if you know, you'll be coming back to work on these patients because it tells you what the standards are and what the lay of the land is. Another alternative is the ANZICS guidelines. So the ANZICS guidelines are, are great because they're a conglomerate guideline that's written very practically. Um, I'll be honest, I've never met the people who wrote it. Uh, it would be an absolute pleasure to talk to these people online or otherwise. Uh, I think it's very commendable. It's a very mature way of, of discussing the issue. And I think that the, the biggest advantage of reading that is it's more westernized in the sense that it, it's more applicable to a modern Western infrastructure as opposed to an Eastern or Middle Eastern infrastructure. It's just the way that our hospitals are built are, are, are slightly different. Having worked in both, you know, the, the, the way that the healthcare systems have developed have met a different challenge, right, to the one that we have right now. And lastly, it's based on multiple uh, papers that are, some of them are actually under peer review now. And uh, some of them have already been peer reviewed. Some of them are non-peer review. And I'll mention what parts are and what part are, parts aren't. So what are the risk factors for you getting COVID-19 if you're volunteering or working in a center that is affected by these patients? So uh, number one, working in the ICU is a risk factor. So if you're working with critical patients, it's going to be a problem for you, or it's going to be something that you're going to have to be cognizant of, that you're at the at-risk population. Number two, if you're providing nursing care, if you're a frontline nurse. Now, this is very intuitive, but you know what's very uh, interesting is that it's mainly in China that this data has become public. It's not as clearly emphasized in the Spanish and Italian data, which is not peer-reviewed. Listen. It's by no means uh, me judging anybody, but in the Italian data, it also seems that there's a, an equal distribution between doctors and nurses, more so than in China. This might be the way that they the division of labor situation. This might be uh, the availability of personal protective equipment. It might be something else. The third risk factor is a lack of personal protective equipment. So in every case where they've done a root cause analysis as to why or if there was any other th thing that could have prevented it, they found that a lack of personal protective equipment that was appropriate was there. That doesn't mean that they looked at all the cases. But in the cases that they did, personal protective equipment pay played a key role. And there were two factors to this. The first factor was a lack of education or a lack of insight. What I mean by that is the person who's taking care of the COVID-19 patient didn't realize that the patient could be COVID-19 positive or the person taking care of the COVID-19 patient did not realize what they had to wear or that it wasn't available, right? And, and those three contexts have not only been published in peer-reviewed journals, they've actually been published online. You know, they, they've been published online in, in newspapers, in, in Twitter, right? And it may not be very valid clinically, but it's something that you have to think about. And I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's intuitive too. That, you know, your supply demand context of personal protective equipment, the sense of urgency and importance, and the attitude that you have when you're addressing patients that could be uh, COVID-19 positive, all factor in, right? And then there's more than 10 hours of active care by a single practitioner. So if you worked more than 10 hours uh, with a patient, then chances are, you could uh, possibly at a greater risk. And this has actually been studied in a paper that is peer-reviewed, the 10-hour rule, right? Uh, it's a Chinese paper. It's a multi-center paper uh, out of Wuhan and a couple of other hospitals. Now, whenever you're doing ICU care, to minimize the risk, 
most of the guidelines feel the closed suction systems, uh, frequent guidances and trainings, and regular donning and doffing drills. So in Italy, they're doing it once a shift. In most other institutions, they're doing it once a day. And in negative pressure rooms for any instrumentation that could lead to a high risk of aerosol transfer. This includes uh, tracheostomies, uh, chest tubes, um, bronchoscopies, intubations, obviously, this instrumentation of the airway, right? It should be done in negative pressure rooms. Having realized that we don't all have them, I, I think I did a dedicated episode on the ICU's role in a pandemic, and I discussed how you could potentially have them. And what the next best alternative is, the next next best alternative is a standard S room, which is sort of a a normal room with neither negative nor positive pressure uh, ventil- uh, isolation means. Um, you should also uh, make sure that you limit the hour of care to four hours of care. Uh, this is in the Chinese uh, manual. It is uh, not mirroring the data in, in the actual uh, paper that was published out of there, but they do a four-hour cycle. So four hours on, four hours off doing other administrative duties, etc., and then four hours on again with an adequate sign-out, obviously. And the last thing is all of the guidelines say this and all of the papers say this. People who are handling COVID-19 patients should not be handling any other patients. So your physiotherapists, your RTs, your uh, occupational therapists, your um, psychiatrists, your uh, adjunct staff of any nature, your primary staff like your physicians, nurses, uh, RTs, um, everybody. They should be part of one sub-hospital, if you will, only for COVID-19. And that limit spread across the hospital. And you need to recognize this with relative urgency, right? In terms of nursing care, um, enhanced guidance for nurses. So make sure that your nurses get what they need. They should be a priority for personal protective equipment. I'm not saying that doctors aren't important. I'm saying that nurses are at higher risk, okay? Segregate the nursing pool. Uh, This includes uh, also segregating them during their breaks. So they should have their own lounge. Uh, they should not be in contact with other nurses from the hospital just to avoid cross-infection to your uh, quote-unquote standard nursing pool. Um, This mainly applied in Chinese non-peer-reviewed data, but I think that it's a standard that should be easy for us to apply. And, you know, it's only right. And like I said, your staff that does COVID should only do COVID, even the educators, because they're in contact with those staff. Now, lack of appropriate personal protective equipment. So daily donning and doffing drills should be done, whether it's by video, whether it's at the point of sign out, whether it's at the point of change of shift, doesn't matter. But it has to be done at least daily. There should be provision of resources. And by provision of resources, I don't mean order it when it's done. I mean, when you're at 25% stock, you order extra stock. Because the numbers are growing exponentially. And what you think is 25% this week will probably be 12% next week and probably be 6% the week after. Okay, I'm not scaring anybody, but that's the reality in Italy. Okay, and that's that's the key difference between reading it as a physician would and reading it as somebody who understands complex science would. All due respect to every single hospital administrator and every single head of department that's been working for five weeks straight now, and I love you guys to death. But when you look at complex systems, guys, we tend to think a little bit differently in that we understand that that 25% is 25% today with an exponential growth pattern that has a complete lack of prediction and no no rate-limiting step. Like, there's no way of capping it, right? So that 25% is probably going to be 12% in a week. So you need to start ordering at 25%, if not at higher, potentially 30%. Okay, depending on the rate of growth in the country. And geographic availability and restrictions. So if you have all your personal protective equipment at the end of a hallway that people have to cross with healthy patients in the middle or non-COVID-19 patients in the middle, don't expect it to be a very efficient way of doing things. Don't expect people to adhere to guidelines, okay? But if you have it in a dedicated station around every single patient area so that it is impossible to go in and deal with the patient without wearing your personal protective equipment, it automatically becomes easier. If you have it donned and doffed uh, between patients as a matter of key, it becomes easier. If you have one nurse per cubicle, 
for your patients or one nurse for every geographic area for your patients and a physician who groups those geographic areas and can actually delegate orders responsibly and only has to assess in a limited amount of time, expect the guidelines to be adhered to. So geographic positioning of patients and positioning of personal protective equipment is just as important as resource allocation and education. In terms of working hours, don't do more than 10 hours, all right? The psychological stress is enough, okay? Uh, especially in countries where they have curfews, it's barely enough time to get back home. So currently where I live right now, we have a curfew from 4 a.m. to 5 p.m. is the only time that we can leave the house. And it's almost impossible for me to get to work more than 10 hours, right? Like, I have to be like speed racer to get back home just in time for the curfew, okay? The current guidances in China are four hours, but, you know, first, they have active training, they have active vigilance, so everybody checks on everybody else. They have robust lines of care, and they have them staggered, so you're cycling four hours on, four hours off. And they have a reduction in the elective workload, so that you have more manpower dedicated to it. And they train this manpower, so they turn their surgical R3s, R4s, and R5s, potentially even their attendings, into fellows, subfellows, and RTs. Okay, they, they actually have a program to convert you, to cross-train you. And, you know, I think that that might be what I, I'm going to start to do probably from next episode, is to sort of provide a blue belt level, so white belt to blue belt transition, and say intubation, and then the drugs for intubation, and then ventilation strategies, and then ventilator troubleshooting and hemodynamics and stuff like that. I think that that might be the next five or six episodes I do, depending on your feedback, obviously, because, you know, I think that that's one of the things that they did phenomenally well in China. They made it pretty clear that everybody needs to be a corona expert by the end of the year, and everybody needs to be uh, adept at running ventilators within two to three weeks. Um, they also made sure that you could work from home, so any meetings could be done online. Rounds, journal clubs, didactic teaching was done online. And telemedicine was used for any sort of consultations. And depending on, on what you guys want, I could do an episode on telemedicine. I'm kind of doing it right now. I'm setting it up for a bunch of colleagues. Uh, full disclosure, I'm doing it through a hospital management team that I work with. In terms of ward etiquette, if you're in front of a patient or at the patient's bedside with pens, pages, phones, iPads, charts, notes, lists, or a coffee... All these things are contaminated now. If you're seeing a patient, none of these things can be with you. Get used to it. Pretend that you're walking into an operating room, okay? And this is why. In theory, your nurse's station, stock rooms, and offices are the font of your resources, okay? Your admission pathway, be it from the emergency room or the ICU, your patient rooms, any places where you're doing x-rays or CT scans, or any places where specimens are being handled, including the, the specimen collection areas and the staff involved in them inside the ward, are all contaminated. So in this diagram, anything that's blue has to stay clean. It's absolute. To prevent cross-infection into other parts of the hospital, for example, the people that are stocking your stock rooms, the people who are bringing you supplies to your offices and lounges, and the people who are coming in for consultations, okay, at the nurse's station, need to remain clean. There is, should be a 0% chance of you contaminating them. In addition to that, there should be a 0% chance of you not wearing PPE when you're in the admission path, the patient's rooms, the specimen handling areas, or the areas with, with radiological investigation. To do that, you need to have an invisible wall where, or zone where PPE has to be taken off or worn. So no PPE inside the nurse's station, stock rooms, offices, lounges, and lockers. Yes, that includes masks. Take them off, hang them outside, get into the area, put them back on again. And preferably, limit your stay in your offices. You can do everything online from home. So why are you in the office? If you get infected and there are only 10 surgeons around, I've just lost 10% of my surgical capacity. If you get infected and there are only five ID guys around, I've just lost literally 20% of my ID staff. If you get infected and you're one of only three GI guys I have who can do endoscopies in the middle of the night, 
All right. The rest of my GI guys have to run one and two for every single upper and lower GI bleed, Crohn's disease patient, etc. You're weakening the army. So if you can work from home, you should work from home. And no personal protective equipment beyond that point. Okay. Within the area where you have COVID-19 patients, admission pathways, patients' rooms. And by admission pathways, I mean the corridors, the entryway, the entrances that they use, the toilets that they use, all those areas. Patients' rooms, specimen handling areas, and radiological investigation areas should not be entered without personal protective equipment. Now, you're going to tell me that there are shortages? Yes, there are shortages. Yes, we're going to have to deal with them. But from what other countries have gone through up till this point, except for Italy and Spain, the shortages occur initially, and then the supply is recalculated. And let me make this clear in a different paradigm. The ward is currently a Zeppelin. It's a new paradigm for us, so it's like a Zeppelin. And the nurse's station, the blue zone, the nurse's station, the, actually I should have called it the green zone, but the, <laughs> the nurse's station, the locker area, and the stock rooms are the control room. If you lose this, if this gets contaminated and everybody in there gets COVID-19, your patients can't get care. So you have to handle this with a sense of urgency. It has to be very clear. On the patient side, all your patients should have proper precautions. They should be educated on wearing their masks, limiting their movement, and you shouldn't be overstocking the room. So we're always in a habit of putting in gloves, dressing sets, etc. Um spare bottles of normal saline inside rooms, especially if they're isolation rooms, just to keep them there in case we need them, quote-unquote. We shouldn't be doing that because we're dealing with a shortage, okay? And deal with the problems early and provide your patients with psycho psychosocial support. So, I mean, I really hope that we eventually get that available wor worldwide. I think that, you know, if you're a psychiatrist, a psychologist, or a counselor and you're listening to this, uh, providing a uh, freeware uh, support service for professionals, uh, for uh, patients, for the families of patients who can't visit them, uh, should be a priority for you. And that's where we need you. That's that's where you know the guys in the front lines need you. Okay, because it's extremely frustrating, and you can see it on Twitter and Instagram with pe people who are perfectly healthy with just having social isolation. They, they, they are suffering, you know, there's a burden there. And we're not going to overcome this on our own. We need all hands on deck. So make sure that you participate actively in, in that venture if you can. In terms of coordinating your response as a hospital and preparing you, your, your isolation zone, or your isolation ward, I would involve engineers because they understand. They understand where the oxygen has to be. They understand the capacity for sewage drainage. They understand biohazard materials, etc. Uh, I would also have your CSST, patient attendant team, and decontamination team all meet together and represent themselves. Nursing, physician assistants, RTs, physicians, and physiotherapists. You should also draw up a short list of people. And the short list of people should be ratioed to, at a minimum, you know, 10 to 30% of your operating staff. And those people should be reserved for corona care, COVID-19 care. Because you're, we're not sure how this is going to go, right? And, and you know, at minimum, that, that should be our, our priority. The agenda on the first day should be uh, stocks, training, criteria, fine-tuning, and any critical incidents. The agenda every day should be what you have in stock, what type of training you have to do today, what criteria are you using to A, admit patients, B, transfer patients to, for further care, for example, ICU, ECMO, etc., fine-tuning, so what you need to work on in terms of fine-tuning the system and uh, any critical incidents. So critical incidents are obviously staff cross-infection, cross-infection to other parts of the hospital, upsurge capacity breaches. Now, by breaches, I don't mean um, breaking the law, right? Uh, and I don't mean... Uh, somebody jumping in and being a hero. That probably falls under staph infections and what you should do about that, right? Uh, and, you know, I would say that if you have any chance of exposure, that's 14 days of active isolation if you're not wearing a face mask. So, you know, that's 14 days where you're not part of the workforce. So you haven't done anybody any favors if you're that hero. But I would say upsurge capacity breaches means... Um,
It means if you have a ward that has traditionally taken care of patients who are, say, IV dependent, so say chemotherapy patients, and your nurses have an extremely adept expertise at IV cannulation, etc., and your stock room is designed for that purpose. You know, you have uh, three different types of IV access down there. You have like uh, altaplase or any other streptokinase variant that can unblock any line. You have access uh, to a portable x-ray machine so that you can check the implantation. You have a small suite to do the procedure for, say, a dialysis catheter or a permacath. You have effectively an IV access suite. But now that IV access suite, complete with its nurses, has been dedicated to treatment of COVID-19 patients. And they've received their first intubated patient with an arterial line in place. So the nurses don't know how to deal with the ventilator. The RT is not comfortable working in that dynamic. And, you know, I've worked with a lot of RTs. They're great people. Uh, and I do have some nursing background in my undergrad. Um, so I understand the pressures that nurses have as well and, and the concerns that they have and, and why these concerns are valid. And I understand why doctors make decisions to move patients in these areas. Everybody has a good reason for what they've done and what they have to do. And, you know, this is stuff that we have to do, right? But if it's outside their comfort zone and you can't prevent it, then you're going to have to have a plan to address it. So the upsurge capacity breaches should be met with a plan on how you're going to uh, introduce the RTs to that ward, how you're going to introduce ventilated patients to that ward, how you're going to introduce nurses to it, who's going to educate them, who's going to be their nurse educator. Is it going to be something that you would want the RTs to do? You know, um, Work on that dynamic early, I would say. But if that does happen and you haven't prepared for it, then it should be discussed as a critical incident. It's just the right thing to do. I'm not saying that anybody should be blamed. I'll get to what I think should be done in a second. But I think it should be discussed at least as, as a critical incident at the end of the meeting. And never events. So never events are things that I can't think of and you can't think of, but just happen to happen. They're a complete disaster. Let's call them what they are, right? We should discuss why they happen and whether or not they're preventable. Uh, see my M&M &M and Grand Rounds episode. Uh, I think it should be out on the, or it should have been out on the 28th of March if I'm not mistaken. Um, it was over the weekend uh, at some point. And, you know, keep your discussions short and to the point. And don't judge people. It's not about who did what and why they did it wrong. You know, if you investigate anybody, if you do something like that at a time like this, clearly the priorities are off. It's about developing a slick, efficient program, getting everybody on board, and providing maximum benefit for your patients, right? And you really have to understand that, that this is a situation where nobody's been through this. And I can prove it to you because I've had colleagues who've trained people for field triage and critical response and, you know, start triage on the field. And I've had colleagues who've trained people to uh, start CPR early. And I've had colleagues who've sort of tried to set up a mini medical school program for nurses. And we're all trying different approaches here. And I think that ultimately, all of these approaches are great. You know why? Because we have to go through all of them. Right? We have to go through all of them. We have to build a staggered response uh, that we can upscale based on our needs. Okay? And this starts with daily drills at the bedside. Okay? And obviously, we need support groups uh, for the frontliners who are working. Uh, they need to be able to vent, to have discussions that are offline, uh, discussions that they find easy to have with people who've been through it. Maybe not the same circumstance, but similar circumstances. Perhaps some retirees who want to contribute uh, could come in and talk about some crises that they may have had and just facilitate the discussions. When I say staggering and upscaling, what I really mean is when you look at the problems that have been occurring worldwide in terms of systems, the first problem has been testing and triage deficiencies. So we need to be able to have good triage people. But if you have good triage people and you only train them for triage because that's the only program that your hospital is running, then you're going to run into a critical care hardware deficiency where you don't have enough ventilators 
And even if you had enough ventilators, you don't have oxygen concentrators and you don't have oxygen on the floor. And so therefore you can't really put a ventilator on the floor if you have to. And now you're cramming them into the resuscitation room, maybe the post-op unit if you're lucky, maybe the CCU. And all of a sudden now you're capped at a hardware failure, right? Or a backend failure more, ap more aptly. If you have the hardware set up and you have a plan for the hardware and your engineers are setting up these sort of oxygen cylinders all over the place, these megaton ones, then you're going to run into a critical care expertise deficiency because your hospital gave all the doctors what they needed, gave all the engineers what they needed to deal with the emergency room problem. But they never trained them to deal with the patient when they're on the ward. They don't even know how to wean a patient now. They don't know how to check for a mucus plug. And so therefore, your program has to include some sort of RT level expertise. And your doctors are going to have to be RTs and they're going to have to listen to the RTs. And that's the way that it has to be done. I've worked in an ICU where I've listened to an RT. He knows it and I know it. He probably knows more than I do. He most definitely knows more, more than I do, at least at the time, maybe even today, uh, to be honest with you. But, you know, that, that dynamic has to be addressed before you need it. it, has to be addressed early. And that's what I call staggering. It's when you gradually build up expertise in different parts that you think might be deficient. And then there's ward rounding deficiency. So your R1s, R2s, and R3s walking into a contaminated room with the chart can never happen. And then there's an insight and morale deficiency. And that's probably the hardest thing, because that means that you're going to have to train people to cope and build coping mechanisms so that you can extend their work intensity, right? You're going to have to train people to be tough and to be resilient. So I would say that that's what staggering is. Upscaling is when you can increase your capacity at different parts of the hospital. And that comes after staggering. So whenever you're designing this program, don't rely on one chief to educate everybody. Because if they're really good at educating uh, nurses and doctors in the emergency room, they're not going to be good at educating them at weaning. It's a different skill set. If they're very good at educating them at weaning, they're not going to be good at educating them at documentation. If they're very good at educating them at documentation, they're not really good, going to be good at uh, dealing with your engineering expertise that you need. And so therefore, I would contend that as the sort of uh, clinical lead as they put it in the UK, or the head honcho, or the chief of staff, with with this landing on, on, on their uh, plate, um, I would say get ready to educate everybody, but get ready to have multiple educators for different phases of care, and cross-train your people. So, you know, make sure that everybody knows what their job is, and make sure that everybody's comfortable doing their job, and start that early. So start it before you even think of needing it. When you're at 50% ICU capacity with COVID-19 patients, your orthopedic surgeon already knows how to switch on a ventilator and what a recruitment maneuver is. They don't need to read the whole Jan Tobin textbook, right? I love that textbook. Uh, I think it's amazing. Best ventilator book ever. But they don't need to read it. They just need to understand the concepts that you need them to do until you can buy enough time to go see that patient, right? Thank you for your time. Uh, good luck, everybody. And listen... The whole aim of this is that by the time you finish training everybody and by the time you finish resource allocation and you're ready to go, you're no longer a Zeppelin, but you have a fleet of Navy-class vessels that are able to take on any mission under the sun with grace and integrity. Right? We should be like the Navy. We should be like Navy SEALs. Clear-cut, clean, efficient, and ready prepared. We shouldn't have to wait for the problem to occur. We should have the plan for the problem before it even coughs in your face. Good luck and please subscribe and let me know your feedback. If you really like this stuff, um, I'm going to do more stuff on COVID-19, but I think that I'm going to veer towards expertise in intubation, for example, for like white belts to blue belt transitions, you know, getting you to go from completely unconfident, but understanding the concepts to maybe doing it with a little bit more confidence and, and, and key results in place, right? Maybe talk about like uh, the psychology of how to deal with intubation and, and, and failure in intubation, which is psychologically quite demanding, I find. Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, be sure to subscribe and let me know your thoughts.